Hi, I'm Giles Martin. I'm here in Abbey Road Studio 2. I was actually born in 1969 um, on John Lennon's birthday, which fascinated him. Um, he said to my dad, no, you're not sort of arsehole he's going to turn out to be. Um, it's funny, growing up as a kid, having a father like George Martin, you can't compare it to anything else. I've never actually swapped dads with anyone. Um, but we didn't necessarily, myself and my sister didn't actually grow up in a in a, in a terribly musical house, apart from, as a kid, I noticed my dad played the piano a lot, and odd people would come back and forth. In fact, when I was a playgroup, my, um, they went around the class, and I was about four or five, and they said, you know, what do your parents do for a living? And they, you know, you know, my dad's an accountant, my dad's a lawyer, my dad's a truck driver, whatever. And I said, my dad just sits at home and plays the piano. And it turns out he was writing, I think he was writing the music for Live and Let Die, the film at the time. And there's huge embarrassment amongst my parents. They go, you know, he's not employed, you know, he's got a proper job. And so it wasn't a sort of thing. I think that, I think growing up in, in, a, in a, it was, I didn't necessarily grow up in a musical household. It wasn't, you know, I had the privilege of meeting people like Paul McCartney at an early age and, and, and meeting, you know, the Beatles at an early age, but they were just friends of my parents. It didn't mean a whole lot to me as a kid. Um, I remember when I became interested in the guitar and became interested in songwriting, Paul did say to me, he was incredibly encouraging, he goes, that's great, you know, I find it difficult to write songs and I'm Paul McCartney. So I did have a privileged sort of background as far as that goes. My parents were always uh, very wary of me getting a proper job. They, I learned to play the guitar, as you can, some people might be able to see quite badly, but behind my parents' back, you know, it was a, it was a thing, you know, don't join the music industry. Um, I'm delighted I did. In fact, I really got involved in music because my dad started to lose his hearing when I was about 16 and he needed a second pair of ears and he didn't really want to tell people he was losing his hearing. So I became his ears to a certain extent. I'd come in and try and help him. By through that, I would learn off him. And we started working together. And it was actually a great thing because I was needed to a certain extent by him, which is nice as a son and a father working together. And at the same time, he was always very good. He never had a sort of, that's my boy kind of attitude. He was always very uh, receptive to my ideas. And in fact, he's been receptive to people's ideas throughout the whole of his career. And uh, he treated me no differently and was always open to, to my suggestions, however wrong they may be. And you know, God knows I made lots of wrong ones. So it gave me a chance to learn, it gave me a chance to respect him for what he does and what he's done. I, I never thought of, I was never any good um, at learning songs off by heart. I mean, you know, I bluff my way through most things. I've never been terribly accurate at playing anything. I can play a number of things very badly, but I was much more interested in playing for a reason. So as soon as I learned to play the guitar with a friend of mine, we started playing in the underground here, started playing in tube stations and playing whatever songs we could learn, basically, you know, as you do. And my parents were, my dad was especially distraught by this. He didn't want, you know, George Martin's son being arrested because it's illegal. At that stage, it was illegal to busk. In fact, the way we played it should have been illegal, but it was illegal to busk. And uh, I then got into playing bands. I formed a band, you know, as you do. And I had a great time, I think, playing in a band, learning to play an instrument. Learning to play a guitar was the best thing I ever did. And not that I practice the guitar or play it very often now, but it opens so many doors as far as if you're willing to play it to people, if you're willing to bore people with it. It's great, you know, to meet people and chat. It's like a, a great hobby to have. It's better than video games, for instance. And, and I think that being in a band taught me more about recording and music for enough than being the son of George Martin did. Because people, if you're the son of um, someone, people expect you have this knowledge, which generally you don't have. You know, people think you grew up in recording studios. And of course, I'd spent more time in studios than probably people, other people are 16, but it's still just a row of buttons. You know, if you're 16, it's still just, you know, a compressor, of course, I know what a compressor does. I hadn't got a clue for a long time because people expect you to know these things. But if you're in a band, you, especially as I was in an unsuccessful band, you have a chance to make a whole lot of mistakes and learn stuff. And the hardest thing, not that it's a bad thing, but the hardest thing if you're a son of some son of some famous or a child of a famous person is you don't get that many chance, chances to make mistakes before people go, people are hoping for the second coming, people are going, he's going to be just like his dad. And if you screw up, you're then the other way. You're then, he couldn't get a proper job. 
And so being in a sort of hidden band gave me a chance to learn. And that's what, you know, music is about evolving. It's about discovering new stuff. It's about learning new songs. It's about learning how things work. It's not about playing the same old things every day. Then things become boring. After playing in a band, I carried on playing in, I always played in, played with people, always like going on tour and playing in pubs and clubs. So I thought, thought, you know, it's just, it was just great fun. And I started writing jingles, I started writing commercials. Um, I started doing gasoline adverts, that was my, for, for France. French gasoline is, was the peak of my life. And that was when I was at university. And then when I left university, I wanted to become a record producer. I wanted to write music people and produce people, but I couldn't, I couldn't, I didn't have any, you know, what do you do? You can't go, I'm the son of George Martin, let me produce you, you know, it's, or, or give me a job. And so I ended up working in press. And at the same time, I started looking at bands. And funny enough, my dad was sort of, he was nervous, I think, of me following in his footsteps at this stage. And I saw a band called My Life Story. They're playing at the, 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 My Life Story, they're playing at the, the Astoria in London. And I went to go see them play and I thought they were good and they were, had a whole lot of strings and I did an arrangement of them and produced them. And they released a single that became sort of number one in Melody Maker and Enemy and the Cool magazines. And someone showed it to my dad and said, look what your son's been up to. And I was just doing it in the evenings, you know, as you do if you're a fan of music and you want to get into music. And that kind of opened doors to me. I left the press job and became a producer. Pro production engineering is, is something that you learn stuff all the time with, like any sort of, sort of music. I mean, I think, for me, starting out and how I am now, if I can work in any form of music, I'm happy. It doesn't matter. It's just, you know, I think um, I produce more stuff now and remix and mix stuff now, probably because in a way it's what people expect of me and maybe I'm okay at it. The Love Project came from, it came from the fact that they needed to do a show. It was uh, George Harrison and Guy Le Liberté, who's the head of Cirque du Soleil, were friends. And they decided to do a show and they decided they couldn't have anyone singing Beatles songs a la Mamma Mia. They didn't want, you know, a chorus singing Hey Jude on stage. And I think that's the right decision. And so they approached my dad and I just had quite a lot of success in the UK doing classical stuff at the time. And Apple came to see me and I sat with my dad and talked to them about it. And I said to them, I could try doing, creating a gig that never happened. And Neil Aspinall, who was the head of Apple, said, you know, I'd love, you know, till we talked about, because he was their roadie, we talked about their shows. We talked about, you know, starting off with Long Tall Sally and finishing with Twist and Shout, or, you know, creating this thing. And I said, well, listen, with Pro Tools and digital stuff, I can perhaps create a gig that never happened. So under complete secrecy, uh, I went upstairs here into a very small room and took some material and I took the beginning, the, sorry, the, the drums from the end and get back because I realized they're the same tempo and because I thought I'd start a gig, never happened with a drum solo going into a song and started moving things around and you know, people said mashing up, I always thought it was a bit rude um, and then thought how am I going to start this and got the piano from a day in the life and turned that backwards because I thought if that makes a good ending it'll make a good beginning as it sucks into the chord from Hard Day's Night. I just had fun, you know, and my view was, you know, if I can impress my dad doing Beatles stuff then that's pretty good, you know, as a son you're always trying to impress your dad I think or, or compete in some way and it just so happened that it was on Beatles stuff and I was auditioning for the Beatles and I really thought that they probably wouldn't like it. You know, I, I really thought that people would think this is a really bad idea. It sounds like a bad idea if you just talk about it. And I then took Within You, Without You and Tomorrow Never Knows and stuck those together because I thought this will definitely get me fired, if nothing else. And they came and they really liked it. They liked the ideas. And so I ended up becoming um, the sort of... <laughs> you know, the sort of legacy which I kind of fought against for a long time, and here I am now in Abbey Road talking about it, um, suddenly became part of it. And uh, I backed up all the catalogue and the Pro Tools and started working on this, on this project, which, which became love. Um, I came with my dog Stan and went to my room and started working, you know, we had a list. I worked with the director of the show and my dad. My dad would come in sort of two days a week and I'd play him ideas and we'd work through stuff. So he was kind of producing me doing it. But the bosses were 
the Beatles, Ringo and Paul, and Olivia, Olivia Harrison and Yoko Ono, who were representing George and John. And it was important that they liked everything. They had to hear everything before it was passed on anywhere else. And the interesting thing about the Beatles, it's such a protected circle, rightfully so, that if you do something and no one likes it, no one ever hears it. You know, and that's actually quite a good thing for me because it means I could take risks. You know, occasionally people at Abbey Road were sort of, you know, people who never hadn't heard anything, which the majority of people here didn't like the idea of what we were doing and didn't like the idea of me coming in and changing. People think it's changing history, but it's not because I'm not deleting anything. I wasn't, you know, I, I was just really trying to do something different. And Ringo and Paul would come in. The funny thing is they come and listen to stuff and they're not allowed to take stuff away either. It's not like you give them a CD. The only chance of them listening to the new mixes we were doing was by coming here and listening to them. And then later as we got the technology sorted out and secure drives were done, I would go and see Yoko and sit down with her and work through stuff. And it's fascinating. For me it was fascinating because I have no past with them. You know, I have no, I certainly wasn't there at the time. And so it's kind of on an even, I'm, I'm, I'm way down the pecking order, but it's kind of, I mean, on an even keel, as it were. There's no history, I have no, you know, experience of anything they did. So it was quite easy for me just to go, do you like it or you don't, what, you don't, what don't you like about it? And they were very proactive in it, um, all four of them, you know, the two wives and Ringo and Paul. And, you know, Paul was, Paul was the one that would give me the fear because he's such a good musician. I mean, Ringo is a pretty good musician as well, and they'd, they'd you know, they know their stuff and they know their own material and uh, occasionally in fact when we were doing the show I sat down with Paul I went through each bit and you know played in bits in the theatre and it was great it was a great evening and he goes you know he said to me you know I just I really I, I have to say I really like what you've done and you, what you've done has been sympathetic with my music and I really appreciate that for me that was just you know the best but when, we, when the show, when it came to the opening of the show, at the very beginning when people walk into the theatre and they're sitting down, I couldn't work out what, because they wanted Beatles music to play, and someone said, well, why don't you just do another 60 minutes of, and I mean, it took me two years to do the 90 minutes. So I decided to get as many Beatles on as I could by taking the vocals off, which is difficult with Beatles stuff, because there's so much leakage on the tracks, and just play the backing tracks. So it's like the Beatles are playing, they're backing as you walk in. So you have Dear Prudence with no vocal, you know, you have Should Know Better with no vocal, and Penny Lane with no vocal. And the idea was that it would counterpoint because when because starts, it's just vocals. So I'm sitting with Paul, and he's two, my dad's there, and Paul's there, and Penny Lane's playing in the in the ceiling of the theatre. And Paul goes, and what's this then? And I went, It's Penny Lane. He goes, I know it's bloody Penny Lane, but what is what's it doing in the ceiling? And I said, well, I just thought it would be an idea to, you know, because they listened to everything. I thought it would be an idea to maybe put the backing tracks up there. And he's like, oh, OK, you know, I'll have a listen. And it's right there because it is their music. And, you know, and my dad sometimes, you know, it's, he feels embarrassed because it's, it's not his music and it certainly isn't mine. It is there. It's, they were, there were four Beatles and it was their band and that was it. There's no fifth Beatle. With music, there's things you'd like to do. I, I wish I could play things better, you know. I've always thought, you know, it'd be great to, to really learn how to play the bass properly, or guitar properly, or piano properly, you know. Um, but uh, it's just a question of time. Maybe I'll start watching our video tunes and, and then become a better musician. But, you, you know, there's, I'd like to, you know, work with you know, a really good young band. At the same time, I'd love to go and do something like the Love Project with something else, you know, with taking, taking stuff and creating, make people listen to music again. The good thing about Love is it does, people do analyze and people do listen, and people don't have it on the background, they do actually get into it. And that's why we do music. We do music because we're passionate about it. And so really, I mean, I, I'm about to write a television thing. I'm, you know, you just, it's a question of writing, producing and being creative and anything that lets you do that, you take. And every day, I just can't believe I, I can do this for a living, you know. I was told by my parents for years it's an impossible job to do for a living, despite coming from my background, because I think maybe when I have kids, I'll be doing the same thing, you know. Don't go into music, you know. But it's just, it's, you do it because you love it. And, that's, and, and if you can get paid for it, it means you don't have to do another job to get in the way as well, so it's fantastic. I would say to anyone learning an instrument, anyone you know, struggling, because let's face it, we all struggle with instruments all the time, and we struggle with music, 
is that no matter how hard it is, it's hard for everyone. And that love that you have for it, never let go of it. Because you, know, you might be trying to learn a song and go, I'm never going to learn this. But the fact of it is, you do. You do learn and you do move on. And the thing to do is never ever give up. Never ever lose that drive and that, that feeling you get when you work something out or you hear some great music. Because it's much better than sitting down and watching the telly. I mean, the thing about, the thing about music is that I think if anyone's toured, I used to tour a lot, you know, you end up kind of working on automa automatic pilot. And, uh, and you get, you start amusing yourself with stuff. I was playing bass in a band, and you start playing the same things over and over again. And, and uh, I was once in Germany, and I used to jump off the stage. And, and I jumped off the stage, and I had no idea until I left the theater, how far I was jumping. We played the end of the concert, and I jumped off the stage, and there was no crowd there. I mean, let's face it, it wasn't that popular, but there was, there was a break before the people. And I launched off the stage, and seeing the band's faces, and they looked at me, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to die. I'm going to die in a, in a shit club in Germany. And I dropped about 12 feet. My bass amp almost followed me, because I you know, didn't have wireless or anything. I just, the bass, <laughs> it was like Wile E. Coyote. The, my lead unraveled. <laughs> it's the only thing that kept me alive. And an Ampeg SV200 over there called, came, came crashing out afterwards. But yeah, I spent most of my time being laughed at by people. You know, I think it's important. I think it's important in studios to have a good laugh. It's funny, I mean, you know, it's, you know, the Beatles, it's one thing, that was, one thing that was shocking for me from listening to all of the tapes, everything they did, was not you know, how serious it was. It was how much kind of fun there is in the tapes. Even when you think, oh, the White Album, they didn't get on. They're really cracking up most of the time. And it's kind of, you forget that actually they came to the studio to have a good time. And all the other stuff you read about happened in offices and accountants and all that sort of stuff. Most of the studio stuff is great. And that's the thing about music. Music should be fun. You know, if you're learning music, have a laugh with it. And don't sit on your own and do it. You know, find someone to play with. Because... Uh, the great thing about music is there's always someone worse than you. you can, I mean, in my case, you really have to hunt them out. But, you know, there is. And so show off to someone. Well, the, I mean, the great thing about the internet is the fact you can, you can delve into the world of songs and work out chords. And one of the problems I struggle from is you look on the internet, and quite often the, the chord sheets are wrong. And there's some guy going, if you know the right way this song goes, please write in. You think, oh, that's no good. I can work that out. And the great thing about iVideo tunes is it breaks down that barrier and you've suddenly been taught by professionals. You've suddenly been taught in a simple way by professionals. It's kind of inspired me. You know, I saw iVideo tunes before, before I got involved in it. And it's inspired me to like going, right, I'm going to see if I can learn the piano better now. You know, and I think that's a great thing. You know, people don't have access to the best people in the world. And now, with iVideo tunes, they do. You can be taught by some of the best people, you know, from home. And the way it's shot and the way it's done is very simple. You know, if I can understand it, it's very simple. So I think it's a great thing. It's a great learning tool for people. And, uh, and I think hopefully it'll, be, it'll create great musicians in the future. Hi, this is Giles Martin. I'm here in Abbey Road Studio 2, talking about We Can Work It Out by the Beatles. We Can Work It Out was written by Paul and John, and Paul wrote the verses and John wrote the choruses. Um, it's quite interesting because the song itself, Paul started, and it's sort of based on his fractious relationship with Jane Asher that was going on at the time. But that said, it's still a positive look at arguments. You know, it's you know, typical Paul optimism. And John, on the other hand, was kind of, you know, a little bit, a bit more negative, a little bit like, you know, it's getting better all the time, it can't get much worse, we can work it out, life is very short, and there's no time, you know, that's the, uh, you know, for fussing and fighting, fighting admittedly, but it is a minor shift, and it is, you know, John sort of bringing things a little bit down to earth. The song itself is very simple, they were accused in 66 of, of writing a formulaic pop song like Day Tripper was a, but they said, no, this is, 
us crafting music. This is a two minute and it's a, it's a brilliant pop single. We can work it out. The song was recorded on the 20th of October, 1965. It was constructed, purely simple, the four guys playing together. Paul playing bass, Ringo playing drums. John playing quite a distinctive acoustic guitar part, hammering on the suspended on the D. And George playing tambourine. And that was put on one track. They then went back in and John played harmonium in the choruses, filling out the choruses. And I think they probably had a harmonium in the room somewhere here. Quite a difficult instrument to play because you have to pedal with your feet while playing it, pumping air through. And that's the volume of it. That's the only way you can control the volume. On the third track, they went around the microphone and did their vocals. In a typical Beatles style, style, on the fourth track, they did their vocals again, but this time with harmonium swells. And this could have been my dad playing harmonium because the three of them were singing. Now the song is distinctive for various things. I mean, it's a fairly simple two minute pop song, apart from at the end of the chorus that sort of grinds into a three, four rhythm on the B minor, um, which kind of separates, it means the song can accelerate and it sort of accentuates the sort of, the John Lennon written sort of, you know, life is very short, you know, for fussing and fighting. And it's just the way the Beatles always put music around their lyrics, you know, opposed to just writing a song and putting lyrics over the top. Trying to see it my way, we'll have to keep on so we can work it out is, is uh, I'll see if I can work it out for you now. Very corny, that indeed. Um, it's based around D, and it's kind of sus G and non sus G, and what that is is just going. And then moving to a C, so you have a G at the top. And that's kind of the way the verse goes. And it's very kind of, you know, almost birdsy in a way. It's, uh, I'll play a very rough rhythm. The choruses are kind of skiffle. If you listen to the drums, they're kind of double time. And the, and the guitar just plows on, going D, G. D, A seventh, back to the verse again. Same. G, D, G, A7. Now here's John Lennon's contribution to the song, which is, you know, slightly downtrodden, going to B minor. Descending on the A to G, F sus 4. And then this is the 3 4 bit. Descending. Repeat. Descending. Sus4. Same. And back into the verse again. So it's just a very simple pop song. Trying to see it my way. Do I have to keep on talking till I can? This is We Can Work It Out by the Beatles. This song is in the key of D in standard tuning. And the intro is really just the verse. It actually just begins on the verse. And it's interesting because it's a three measure pattern that gets played. Uh, it's a repeating pattern. It starts with a D chord. I'm just going to explain the basic chords first and then play it. Uh, basic D chord in open position. Adding the fourth finger on the third fret of the first string makes this chord a D suspended fourth chord, or D sus four. So you have a D chord, D sus four, and then a C major chord, and the uh, interesting thing about, thing about this C chord is I still have this G on the third fret of the first string ringing in there, so it's otherwise just a basic open C chord. Back to D, so the whole part will sound like this.
And the idea is to strum in more or less in 16th notes with the right hand. One, two, three, four. So I'm strumming um, down, up, down, up for every beat. One E and two E and three and four. One, two, three, four. So the overwhelming um, strumming pattern really deals with 16th notes. And what's going to happen is you're going to add the fourth finger to the third fret on beat three of the very first measure. One, two, three, four, four. And into the second measure, you're going to do the same thing, but keep the, the uh, fourth finger down on the third fret. So you get In the third measure, just move to the C chord. And then back to the D. So the whole thing is. It repeats. And that's the verse for We Can Work It Out. We can work it out. We can work it out. Think of what you're saying. You can get it wrong and still you... The chorus is really simple. Just a two measure pattern from a G chord for two beats to a D major chord for two beats. G and for two beats and then to A7. So an A7 chord is just like a basic open A major chord with a third string, the open G ringing in it as well. So it's just G, D, G, A7. G, D, G, A7. And that's the chorus for We Can Work It Out. The bridge goes through a few more chords. I'm just going to play it in time and then explain it slowly. So that starts with a B minor chord in second position. My first finger is barred across the second fret, strings one through five, and I'm muting the sixth string with the tip of my first finger. My second finger is on the third fret of the second string. My third finger is on the fourth fret of the fourth string. My fourth finger is on the fourth fret of the third string. So it's B minor. And you're going to play this for a measure and a half, or six beats. One, two, three, four, one, two. And on the third beat of the second measure, you just lift the first finger off the fifth string so you get the A bass note. Three, four, one, two, three, four. Into a G chord for one measure. One, two, three, four. And then to an F sharp seven sus four chord. So for this, my first finger is barred across the entire second fret. My third finger is on the fourth fret of the fifth string, and my fourth finger is on the fourth fret of the third string. For two beats, one, two, and then resolving it to just F sharp seven. So for that, I'm just lifting the fourth finger off the third string and replacing it with the second finger on the third fret of the third string. For F sharp seven. So really that's the first half of the bridge there, the first half of the, uh, the part in 4-4, four, four. so it sounds like this. And at this point, uh, it's going to go into 3-4 timing, and it's actually a metric modulation, which means that uh, the rhythm that is a quarter note triplet in the old tempo actually becomes a regular quarter note in the new 3-4 tempo which is really just a fancy way of saying that it's going to move to 3-4 time and the tempo is going to speed up a bit. So it sounds like this. And you can see how all the motion in that part is done with the first finger. My, my uh, second, third, and fourth finger are fretting the B minor chord. So I'm just going to play the B bass note on the fifth string, second fret, strum the chord on B2-3. So that's one, two, three. Lift the first finger off to get the open A string. One, two, three and then bring the first finger down to the third fret of the sixth string for a B minor over G chord now, which is also a G major seven chord, and then bringing the first finger back to the second fret on the sixth string. One, two, three, so we got one. And then the whole part uh, repeats, so here's the entire bridge one more time.
And that's the bridge for We Can Work It Out. The outro is really simple, just a D chord. Uh, you're just going to go to that same 3-4 timing that we had in the bridge. So you're just going to pick the bass note and strum the chord. And it just goes... Three, one, two, three. So I'm just picking the 4th string open, strumming the chord two times, picking the 4th string open two times, and just end on the D chord. And that's the outro for We Can Work It Out. This is the performance of We Can Work It Out. Try to see it my way. You will have to keep on talking till I can't go on. Why you see it your way? Run the risk of knowing that our love may soon be gone. We can work it out. We can work it out. Think of what you're saying. You can get it wrong and still you think that it's all right. Think of what I'm saying. Can work it out and get it straight or say goodnight. We can work it out. We can work it out. Life is very short and there's no time for fussing and fighting, my friend. I have always thought that it's a crime. So I Chance that we might fall apart